Okay, so we're going to look at how those two general trends can be disrupted. So we said periodic trends, um, protons are increasing while shielding is staying the same as you go across the periodic table, so the attraction for the outer electrons increases. And we said as you go down the periodic table, you're adding another shell of shielding electrons and another shell of another shell, so you decrease the attraction. But there's two ways that you can break that. So if you expect to see a trend, well, I expect the attraction to increase as I go across. If you don't see that, that trend is broken, look for one of these three things. One could be electron-electron repulsion. And what that means is two electrons in an orbital are, less, are a little less stable than one electron in an orbital. So we'll see that in a second. Um, S orbitals are a little more stable than P orbitals. There's some slight shielding because the S's are going to spend more time closer to the nucleus than the P. And the third thing is transition metals. We know we go 4S2, 3D, 10. So as you're going across the, the transition elements, you're adding one proton for every one shielding electron. So usually you're adding protons and not adding any new shielding electrons. Um, but with the transition, you're actually increasing the shielding. So that's a third. So our first one, let's look at electron-electron repulsion. So the kind of question you would get dealing with this is, um, you won't be asked to predict when electron-electron repulsion is a problem, but you'll be given a time and you'll notice it breaks the trend and you'll have to explain why it breaks the trend. So removing an electron, oops, removing an electron from nitrogen is harder than removing an electron from carbon. Explain. Well that one, that's what we expected. Attraction increases as you go across. So there's the same number of um, shielding electrons, same number of shells, but one more proton for nitrogen than carbon. So that makes sense. So for the first one, I'll just go ahead and put um, nitrogen has one more proton and same number of electron shells. more attractive. That's what we expected. You can also talk about how that's going to pull the electrons in closer. It's a smaller radius. Greater is the effective. These are good words to use. Okay, so we, we expected that. Nitrogen is more attractive than carbon. So then next, we'd expect oxygen to be attra more attractive than nitrogen, but we're told removing an electron from oxygen is easier than removing an electron from nitrogen. Explain. So it just got harder and then it got easier something is going against what we would expect. Because oxygen has one more proton than nitrogen with the same number of electron shells. So if I have something I can't explain with those two things, I look at electron-electron repulsion. And I'll know that from the orbital box diagram. So if I've got oxygen right here, it has one, two, three, four, um, five, seven, eight. It has eight electrons total. Okay, so that's oxygen. And meanwhile, nitrogen, very similar, but one less electron. Right? Because nitrogen is seven electrons total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so I can see that nitrogen had this half-filled shell. I know half-filled shells are fairly stable. One of the reasons that they're stable is they don't have any electron-electron repulsion. So this oxygen, um, I'm going to remove that electron right there because there were two electrons in this box in this one orbital. That means those electrons, both being negative, are close to each other. They're a little repulsed by each other, a little repelled. So the electron-electron repulsion in the oxygen is enough to make it easier to remove that electron, despite the general trend that it should get harder and harder and harder to remove an electron because you have the same number of shielding electrons at that point, um, but you're just adding protons. So it's kind of like you have, at, nit at carbon you have, um, we have six, six protons, and there are two shielding electrons, one, two. And then with nitrogen we have seven protons, and also two shielding electrons. Doesn't matter that there's five outer electrons, those five aren't shielding, because we're looking at how hard is it to remove just one of the outer electrons, and then eight protons, with again, just two shielding electrons. So I didn't add any shielding electrons, I just added protons. I would expect, 
it would get harder and harder to remove the outer electron. That's a general trend. However, this electron-electron repulsion was enough to make it easier to remove an electron from this oxygen than it was from the nitrogen. And again, you're not asked to predict when it will happen. You'll be told removing an electron from oxygen is easier than removing an electron from nitrogen. Why? And since you can't use your typical trend, start looking at the three things. Electron-electron repulsion is one. The other is s orbitals versus p orbitals. There's slight shielding. So these guys are a little more stable than these guys. So the general trend we expect is that it gets easier and easier, or sorry, it gets harder and harder to remove an electron as you go across because same thing, there's more protons, same shielding. So let's look at these guys. We're going to look at um, do, 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 beryllium, lithium, and boron. Okay. So the trend we would expect, we've got three protons, two shielding electrons, one valence, and that's going to be our lithium. We have four protons, four positive things, being blocked by just two shielding things and two valence electrons. That's beryllium. And then we have boron. Boron also has, oops, forgot to write. Boron's going to be five protons. So one more positive thing. Five positive protons, two shielding electrons, and then three valence electrons. Okay, so if I'm looking at how, um, did I say easy? If I'm looking at how hard it is to remove an electron from these things, I'm gonna say, well, they all have two um, shielding electrons, one electron shell blocking the outer electrons from the inside, so that's, that's evil, even playing field. But this has three positive things to be attracted to. This has four positive things to be attracted to. This has five positive things to, to be attracted to. So I would expect boron should have the greatest attraction, then beryllium, then lithium, based on the general trend. And here it says, it is harder to remove an electron from beryllium than lithium. We expected that. Explain. So our explanation, same number of electron shells, blocking the outer electron. Um, the outermost valence electron is attracted to three, three protons in lithium, four protons in beryllium, so it's a greater positive charge, has a greater Z effective. You can also talk about the electrons being pulled in more and having a smaller radius. So then the next part, it says it's easier to remove an electron from boron than it is from beryllium. That's weird. That's not what I would expect. So again, I like to draw the orbital box diagrams for these and see if that helps me out. So they both go 1s2, 2s2, and then the p slightly higher. And then for boron, same thing. Um, 1s2, 2s2, and then the 2p slightly higher. Okay, so let's draw these in. Um, I'm going to have four electrons, so I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. And then, so my P's are just all empty. For boron, I go one, two, three, four, five. And then I can see that I'm removing an electron, even though I'm removing them only from that second energy level, I can see that here I'm removing an electron from an S orbital, and here I'm removing an electron from the P orbital. And that helps me remember that the S orbitals are at a slightly lower energy level, they're slightly more stable, so it's going to be a little bit harder to remove the electron from the S than the P. So that's what's going to create that trend. It does get harder. As I go across, it is harder to remove an electron from beryllium than lithium, but it's easier by just a little bit to remove it from boron, and that's because it's being removed from a higher energy P orbital, slightly higher, a little bit of shielding from the S's. But then it gets harder to remove the electron from the carbon, because you have another proton. Harder to remove the electron from the nitrogen, another proton. Slightly easier to remove the electron from the oxygen, and that's due to the electron-electron repulsion. But then again, harder to remove from the fluorine because one more proton, same shielding. Harder to remove from the neon, uh, one more proton, same shielding. So the general trend is still there, but it gets adjusted by things like P's being shielded by S's and electron-electron repulsion. The third thing I would look at, this one's easy to know if you're supposed to look at this one, is transition metals. If you're in the transition metals, something else is happening. So it says, transition metals um, have increasing protons correlates with the increasing shielding electron. So typically as we go across the shell, we're adding core electrons 
and more protons. So the shielding is the same, but the protons get positive, more and more and more positive, more and more positive protons. So the attraction is stronger and stronger as you move across the periodic table, except for the transitions. And that's because you're adding to an inner shell, you're adding electrons to the inner shell. So let's look at um, the board diagram we would have from, how about scandium to titanium? So scandium has 21 protons. 21 protons, and it has um, 21 electrons. So we'll go two on the S. Actually, let me write it out because it's, we're getting all the way to the Ds. So one is 2, 2, S, 2, 2, P, 6, 3, S, 2, 3, P, 6, 4, S, 2, 3, D, 1. So just one D. Okay, so I'm gonna go two on that first shell, right? I'm gonna put eight on the second shell. And then I've got in the third shell, I have two plus six is eight plus one more. I've got nine. So nine electrons here. And then on the fourth shell, just two valence electrons that I'm looking at. Okay. So that's scandium. And then I go over to titanium, which has 22 protons. It will be the same thing, but 3d2. So I'll go two electrons on the first, eight electrons were on the second shell. Third shell have the eight plus 3d2, so 10 electrons, and on that outermost shell there's two valence electrons. So when I'm looking at these, I can see that this guy has one more proton to attract the electrons than this, 22 versus 21, but this guy also has one more shielding electron because we added to a d orbital when we added that last proton. When we went from the 21st proton to the 22nd, we went from having nine electrons on the third shell to having 10 electrons in the third shell. So this guy has um, 19, 19 shielding electrons. And then this guy has 20 shielding electrons. So more shielding, and this guy has 21 positive protons to attract, and this one has 22 positive protons to attract. So those things end up um, canceling each other out a little, like just about you have more positive attract or more positive to be attracted to, but you have more electrons blocking the way. So more shell shielding. And so what happens is, as you go across the transition, it remains fairly constant with these little increases here and there. So you could be asked why, if, if you're going across the periodic table, might it be easier at some point to remove an electron from something, from a transition metal that has one more proton than another transition metal. And that's it. So generally, as you go across, more protons, same shielding, stronger attraction. As you go down the periodic table, um, more shielding. But always look for electron-electron repulsion. Look for um, the transition elements and look for removing from an S versus a P if you are not following the general trend.